There is something very seriously missing from the keel of our sailboat that has caused us and other Valiant 40 owners headaches. It could also be missing from other sailboats as well. Come on and I'll show you what I'm talking about. It would be a big help if you click on the thumbs up button down below and also if you haven't already the subscribe button. Also in the video description there is a link to the tip jar if you don't mind helping out in that direction. Hello, we are Patrick and Rebecca Childress on the 1976 Valiant 40 Brick House. We're hauled out at the Zululand Yacht Club in Richards Bay, South Africa. Patrick has finally had time to really dig into our keel and find out what's missing. Before he shows you our keel, he's going to show you a couple of other boats with similar keels. Ready? Put your ears on. You not only want to see this, you want to hear it too. Let's start with this sailboat. This keel is very similar in shape in proportions as the keel on our Valiant 40 brick house. There's something very solid in the forefoot of this keel and something very hollow in the aft section. And here's another sailboat. This is a sailboat still under construction, but a keel, again, somewhat similar to our Valiant 40 keel. The owner has access from inside of the boat to that hollow area in the forefoot. That is so when the boat is launched, he can add weight to that area to get the proper fore and aft trim to the boat. And the stern area, those hollows, he does not have access to that. So this is beginning to show that not all keels are totally solid. While we are here, I want to show you something very interesting on the bottom of this keel. The original builder became ill. He had to sell the boat. And so, of course, you'll never see that dream or experience that dream of crossing oceans on a boat that he built himself. So the new owner now has taken over the construction. But what I wanted to show you here is the boot that's on the bottom. And this appears to be a conveyor belt, a nice protective heavy rubber slab on the bottom of this keel. And unfortunately, the new owner doesn't know how this is adhered to the keel. I mean, this is all solid. It almost looks like 5200 underneath here with a little bit of uh, clear fiberglass resin over it. But I thought that's a great idea, but it's untested. This boat has never been to the water, so who knows how long it'll stay adhered to the keel. But it gives me the idea. I'd love to do the same thing. I probably won't, but I'm going to go ahead and put more layers of fiberglass on the bottom of my keel. It's the same thickness. This is about, well, maybe about an inch thick. Rounded on the edge. So now let's go take a look at the keel on our old Valiant 40 and I'll show you the problems that we had with it. You can see here that there is a definite vertical line. Forward of that line, it is solid lead. I like the idea of solid up front for collision problems. And behind that, it is just simply a fairing. There's no weight back there really to speak of. That is closed cell foam that is encapsulated in about 3 8 inch thick fiberglass. And that is where the problem begins. When they built this boat, and apparently a number of other of these early Valiant 40s, they must have run out of expanding foam that day at the factory. Because it's well known amongst this era of boat not to put blocks so far aft on the keel when you haul out because you'll get deflection. It'll be bowing out oil canning on each side and some boats have actually cracked their keel and caused structural damages of the keel. That just shouldn't happen. On our boat I could see a little deflection from time to time when I block that far aft but I feel as though we should be able to block wherever we want and not have any keel problems. So that's what I'm going to do is open up this keel and find out what's going on inside. So 
So it would appear that there is a spline of closed cell foam down the center of this keel with hollows towards the aft end on both the starboard and the port side. The farther forward I went, the more solid this closed cell foam was. So the big hollows, the big problems were all in the aft section of the keel. As you can see from the discoloration inside some of these holes, moisture has been in these voids. So I took a drill with a 3 8 inch bit and drilled drain holes on the very tip, lowest section, aft section of the keel, in both port and starboard, and then took a water hose and thoroughly flushed out the whole area, the void area. And I did this about five times on both the starboard and the port side. And then I took a hair dryer, two of them actually, one for the port, one for the starboard, set it on the low heat setting and let it blow inside these holes 24 hours a day, seven days a week for an entire month. And the most amazing thing is these hair dryers are still good. They just seem to run forever without any complications on the low heat setting. And the time came to plug up the drain holes on the bottom of the keel and start pouring in resin. I used polyester resin. I was very careful not to mix too much catalyst in it so it would overheat while it was setting up in this confined area. And also the polyester resin doesn't affect the closed cell foam. Polyester resin would eat up open cell foam. Open cell foam is like what comes in the spray can from the hardware store that you use around the house for insulation purposes. But the polyester resin was good enough for this. I just started pouring in and made sure I didn't put in too much at one time and heat everything up. And this took about three days since I was on the cautious side of filling these holes. As I filled up the holes, I would patch over the hole I was working through with a very thin fiberglass cloth and then start pouring in at the next higher hole. And once that was filled, I worked my way all the way up to the very top hole. And once that hole was overflowing, I made a pouch of fiberglass cloth so I could pour into that and fill it all the way up to the top. It took 13 liters, almost three and a half gallons of resin to fill up these voids in the aft section of this keel. But now we know that it has the structural integrity that the designer intended for this keel to have. So now we can block it up wherever we want when we haul out. And we won't have any of those structural issues to be concerned about. Now I can take my gauge to measure the thickness of the fiberglass. I can't use this end. I have to use a little wire end depth gauge. And that is three tenths of an inch thick. These don't read in sixteenths of an inch. So there is an equation. We need to expand out from the edge of the hole 12 times the thickness. So 12 times 3, 36. So that, that'd be 3 inches, 0.6 for the distance out to the edge. And that's true for any kind of a hole in fiberglass for repairing. That way it's dished out. You expose as many layers of fiberglass as possible. You get the best adhesion then over a broad area to repair that hole. So I already measured out my magic marker and a string rather than holding this and going around. Chrissy put this right down to the end of the magic marker. I'll do that to this one. I'll do that to all the other holes on the boat. And then we'll be ready to build it back up and make the repairs. So now I have everything filled up, all the voids are filled, I have patches on the access holes and I've taken out the very aft blocking as you can see. So now I'll start laying in a big heavy layer of fiberglass around this bottom just to help to build up that area and give us a little more protection in case we ever do bump the bottom, which we have in the past. 
and that'll certainly help to protect the keel, give us a little more cushioning. It may not be as good as that nice conveyor belt rubber bottom, but it'll certainly be better than what we have now. Well, I just had a big major failure with epoxy resin. But what I had been using is Kosan, K-O-S-S-A-N. I bought that in Indonesia, and I believe it's made in Malaysia. And I just ran out of the last of my supply of the uh, resin for doing all the patches on the keel, doing the layup. So I just wanted to finish it off, and I went out and bought this stuff at a local store. Comes in equal liter size bottles. When I bought it, I asked the person in the store, what's the mix ratio, which should be obvious, and they said it's one to one. So after three days, I could still take my thumb and poke it into the setup resin. It was just way too soft. It was never going to harden up properly. So I went back to the store and asked, well, what's the mix on this stuff? I asked a different person. They said, well, you mix this amount of much of that and this amount of that and this is the resin and that's the uh, catalyst and we determined that it's a three to one mix so after scraping off all of my work that this screwed up um, I went back and just did a small area of layup and a little bit of filler and again it worked better with the three to one mix but still it was not the performance that one would expect from a good epoxy resin so it just has a price tag on here, no other labeling. Same with this, it used to have a price tag and it just had a, a, a name here, apparently of who makes it or distributes it or something, but that's it. So I'm tired of this generic stuff. I asked some of the guys in the yard about this, who are the professionals here, they said it doesn't work well, it's very difficult to make it work well, and they all use something from AMT. AMT Composites. And it's a distributor of epoxy products based in Cape Town, although I think they have an office in Durban. And uh, they distribute something called Gurit Epoxy Products. Um, I used to use West System back in the U.S. Good product. Uh, the metered pumps makes it real easy for getting just the right ratios, which you have to be extremely accurate measuring epoxies. You can't really eyeball it. You have to weigh it or pump it with meters. Um, but even if I was back in the U.S., I couldn't use the West system anymore. It's just gotten to be way too expensive, and I'd be looking for an alternative there. But here, the Gurit, I've never heard of it before. Uh, a little bit of research that I've been doing, it, apparently it's just as good as West System. Uh, they use it in the aerospace industry, uh, making wind turbine blades, a lot of yacht work, so that has a lot of possibilities, but I can't be dealing with generic stuff anymore. I need something that's predictable and that's going to perform on this boat. So I'll let you know in the next video what direction we go. There are different other products here in South Africa other than the Gruet through AMT. Um, so that's all to be seen. But this is really just to let you know that all epoxies are not the same. In one of these videos coming up in the future, we'll have to tell you more about resin blisters and how they differ greatly from osmotic blisters. And this is why we have so many big open potholes on our boat right now drying out. Also in the future, we have some supplementary videos coming up by professional captains and how they operate their delivery boats out in the middle of the ocean. A lot of good tips from the pros coming up. So thanks a lot for watching. If this video is worthwhile for you, please give it a thumbs up and a subscribe. And we'll see you again soon. Oh, also there's a, um, a link in the video description to the tip jar if you don't mind helping out in that direction. Thanks a lot and we'll see you next time.